Good day, everyone. My name is uh, Fulvio Franchi, and I'm Associate Professor at the University of Bari in Italy. And today, I'm going to present you um, the concept of extreme environments from a very peculiar perspective, the perspective of planets and planetary exploration. Uh, for that, we need to start with uh, a, a definition. Extreme environments in planetary explorations are uh, often considered terrestrial analogs of other celestial bodies. The reason is that some of these places on Earth are extreme in terms of their physical and chemical condition, and uh, therefore they are similar or analog to other celestial bodies, being that the Moon, Mars, some asteroids, or even exoplanets. So the fact that they are extreme environment, it's relevant uh, for the point of view of life, in terms of uh, organisms that can live under such extreme conditions. And this is important because it can teach us what are the limits of life as we know it on our planet and give us new uh, ideas of how life could have come to existence on our planet, but also how can life be um, found on other uh, celestial bodies and that is the foundation of a science called astrobiology. Now there are many extreme environments uh, some of which you've already seen uh, uh, during the previous modules like cold seeps or hydrothermal vents. Uh, there are also extreme saline environment like salt lakes uh, but also impact crater can be considered analogs although they're not uh, extreme by definition at the present day but they suffered extremely uh, hot and high pressure condition at one point when they formed. So um, in order to frame our uh, module today I'm going to focus mostly on Mars. Mars that is now known for uh, its extreme conditions, high UV radiation, uh, temperatures that are normally very cold, uh, lack of water on the surface. Well, Mars was a much warmer and wetter planet, yet probably extreme if we consider what is comfortable for us and many other animals and plants. So um, we look at early Mars and uh, we will probably uh, focus mostly on microbial uh, organisms which are the one that we expect started life also on our planet. So um, the reason why we are looking at Mars is because Mars is um, full of uh, uh, morphologies, geological features that uh, are striking the imagination of geologists because they look like something we know on our planet. They look like conical mounds, mud volcanoes, layered sediments, all of which have a strong link with water, liquid water, and therefore might have harbored life on early Mars. There are mounds, there are deltas like the one in G0 crater that has been explored as we speak. So we need to look at extreme environments on our planet that have a morphological resemblance with those that we seen on Mars. And today I'm taking you to Africa. I'm going to show you two examples of a fossil and an extant extreme environment, very different, but that will allow you uh, to get to the uh, exercise uh, uh, later on with uh, uh, an open mind about what could be the use 
of extreme environments uh, in uh, planetary science. So we start with the Keskes Mountains in Morocco, so uh, we are in North Africa, in the Sahara Desert. And this Keskes, they take the name from the conical pot used in Morocco to cook the couscous, and you can see that they are beautiful conical mounds. They normally are around 20 meter, uh, 10 to 20 meter high. Uh, they are found in the anti atlas and uh, this area is particularly famous amongst experts because uh, it really looks like an old planet. In fact, National Geographic used this landscape uh, as one of the scenario for their uh, um, uh, movie uh, Mars, uh, for the series uh, Mars. Now, Clearly, we were interested in these mounds because uh, at, at first glance, their shape really looks like the one of Martian mounds that you see here in the grayscale uh, picture. Size, it's comparable. Lamination or layering certification we know on our planet in sedimentary environment, it's due to uh, water or linked to an uh, aqueous environment. So we, um, we decided to study these this mounds and see if they can teach us something about uh, early Mars. So the first interesting uh, aspect of this mound is that they were probably, and I say probably because these are Devonian mounds, so they have more than 300 million years, so it's not really uh, easy to, to get uh, unequivocal answers from these rocks. They are carbonates and they have some uh, minerals like dolomite uh, in this case uh, and some geochemical uh, uh, fingerprints of a potential hydrothermal environment. So we are looking at something that formed underwater in a Devonian ocean that was water infiltrating and once in contact with the magma, this water was uh, uh, re re rising to the, the, the surface and forming this uh, hydrothermal uh, vents. So they probably um, can be compared with what you've seen already before, the black smokers. So environments which are rather extreme for the chemical uh, and physical um, parameters and uh, are known for harboring uh, different life forms, including bacteria. They also have a very strong um, preservation potential. And that is important for us geologists because uh, in order for us to assess the presence or the absence of life forms in this environment, we need to find fossils. And this type of um, extreme environment is very good in terms of preservation potential. Now, the cascades, some of them are also very interesting for another reason, because they look like also another type of extreme environment that you already studied, and that is the cold sips. So where you have methane reaching the surface of the sediments, and you've seen that in present day uh, cold sips, uh, uh, there are a number of chemoautotrophs that thrive because of the presence of methane and methanotrophic bacteria and so on and so forth. It's a complex ecosystem that can also be found in some of the fossils in the Cascades. Now, it is clear that we are not looking for uh, mussels or um, large uh, macroinvertebrates on Mars, but once again, we're looking for bacteria and microbial consortia are thriving at cold seeps. So the fact that there is methane on Mars, uh, it has been proved oh. the first time in the early 2000s when uh, um, methane has been detected in the atmosphere. Um, then for a few years, there's the presence of methane has been strongly debated, but in with the new missions and with new data, we have uh, confirmed the presence of uh, uh, methane in Mars atmosphere. So we're not expecting cold seeps right now on Mars, but they might have been 
environments, extreme environments, similar to the cold seeps in early Mars. Hence, they might be compared with terrestrial cold seeps. Now, I want to take you in a completely different environment. We've, talk, we've spoken about uh, cold seeps and black smokers, and now we get into a continental environment. So far away from the ocean, as a matter of fact, in a landlocked country, which is Botswana. And this environment, which is extreme, it's called the Makadikadi salt pans. Makadikadi salt pans look like this. Very flat over a thin crust of uh, evaporite, so hypersaline environment. The water, even the one underground, is very saline. There are a number of processes that we're going to see which are very interesting because of, they might explain some stuff that we see on Mars. There are some minerals that form because of the extreme condition of this place. And inside those minerals, there are bacteria. And not any bacteria, but extremophiles. So bacteria that love the extreme. Extremophiles. Bacteria and fungi that normally uh, prefer the challenges of an extremely hot or cold environment, extremely saline, or a, an environment where water is present only for a few days a year. So those are very good candidates for astrobiological study because they have learned how to withstand these challenges. And we have uh, good uh, probabilities to find something similar on other planets if life ever existed outside our own planet. Now, the first challenge that these extremophiles have to uh, uh, withstand is radiation. In Botswana, we are at in a craton, it's a plateau at more or less 1,000 meters above the sea level, but there's no shadow. So this surface, it's constantly bombarded by UV radiation. They're not as strong as the radiation on Mars. Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, so clearly there it's extreme. But the bacteria that lives in the crust that you see at the surface of the pan here in the bottom left, they still have to cope with uh, extreme heat, dehydration, and UV, more or less like every one of us when we go and explore that place. The difference is that we have sunscreens and they don't. So these extremophiles are very interesting. They are literally everywhere. You see this beautiful picture of the pan surface. It shows you the crusts that form on top of the pan. And if you're lucky enough, inside these minerals, you might find spores or even cells of these organisms, some of which they live inside the minerals. And they choose to live there because living inside a crystal, inside a mineral, can help them get rid of toxic uh, chemicals or um, to avoid uh, the UV uh, bombardment. Uh, it's not all about living organisms. There are also some processes that are very interesting. On the top two pictures, you see uh, the surface of the pan that is characterized by these polygonal fractures that we call mud cracks. And uh, believe it or not, we have very similar features on Mars. Um, they are much bigger, so we are adjusting theories. Uh, uh, the one on Earth are due to the dewatering of the sediment. Remember, it's a very strongly evaporative environment, extreme. So the small amount of water that arrives on the, on the surface then quickly evaporates, and the presence of clay minerals in the, in the sediment causes these uh, beautiful polygonal patterns. Something similar at a different scale might have happened on Mars. So it's worth to uh, look into these kind of uh, uh, processes on Earth. 
Other interesting features are, again, um, morphologies that teach us how uh, processes due to water upwelling, so the groundwater, wind deflation, evaporation, when they play together, they might form peculiar morphologies that are uh, described also on other planets. So in this picture, I'm comparing um, mound morphologies on Mars and from Botswana. And you can see that they have the same scale and a striking resemblance. They are uh, sub-rounded, they are conical, and they have this beautiful layering. And for sedimentologists like me, the presence of this layer or strata, it's very important because this might have been uh, produced by water. So we decided to study these morphologies on Earth, which by the way is the picture on the far right of the screen. And indeed, there are some uh, interesting uh, hypotheses, both Earth and Mars, early Mars, add a groundwater, well, on our planet is still active, as you can see uh, on the top left of the slide, so the water infiltrates in the highlands and then reach the pan and produce the morphologies. And something similar might have happened also on Mars. You have a crater that creates a depression like a basin and in that depression full of fractures because of the impact the water might rise to the surface and help the precipitation or formation of uh, uh, these uh, uh, deposits. So um, different planets clearly different condition but some similarities. Now, we're still studying this kind of processes uh, and uh, it's just, uh, let's say, an, a working hypothesis, but we cannot avoid noting the striking similarities of the two planets. Another interesting uh, 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 analog is the drainage system of ancient river. On Mars, there are plenty of uh, uh, satellite data um, images that shows that show um, uh, ancient delta or rivers. So uh, on our planet is a bit more complicated because uh, the geology is still active. So these uh, uh, relict deltas and river tend to be covered, but in an extreme environment like the Makhadi Pan, where um, the, the, the mobilization of sediment is limited by the uh, lack of water, we still have a fossil delta that you see in this, uh, in this picture. So the last thing I want to show you about this extreme environment, uh, it's also a very exciting aspect of the job, and is that these extreme environments are laboratories for us also to test equipment that is going to other planets or it's already on other planets. And specifically in the Makarika depends we tested uh, an instrument, which is this one, is a, um, to make it simple, is an instrument that looks at the changes in the solar irradiation. And it's used on Mars to detect uh, dust devils or dust storms, uh, to have uh, another uh, idea of uh, what is the, uh, the weather on Mars. And because the Marcade Cade is particularly dusty and it's full of dust devils, the team, a team from Spain, decided to bring uh, their uh, instrument to Botswana and test it under harsh conditions that can uh, somehow resemble the one on Mars. 
This instrument is actually part of MIDA weather station, so it's on the Perseverance rover that is active on Mars right now. So the data coming from our extreme environment on Earth are fundamental in order to understand the data that are coming from another planet. And this is the instrument that we use on Earth that is basically a copy of the one on the rover. I want to conclude this already very long lecture with uh, um, a special uh, uh, topic that um, will take us far away from Mars. I know I promised to keep the focus on Mars, but I think uh, uh, it's good to have this uh, um, opportunity to see also something uh, far away from Mars. We're talking about a moon of Saturn, which is called Enceladus. This moon has been uh, touched a few years back by the probe Cassini-Huygens that provided some very important information about uh, this moon that has plumes of ice, droplets of ice and uh, 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 other material that are coming out from the South Pole. And the probe identified organics and the presence of methane that triggered a massive uh, effort from the scientific community to identify uh, all the chemical compounds in this moon and the model they presented it's of a living moon it's just 500 kilometers across so it's a very tiny moon but the data we have uh, suggests that it's a living moon so it has uh, a core with some geothermic energy that can sustain hydrothermal circulation. So this moon, which is an icy moon, it has a shell of ice and an ocean underneath, a salty ocean, exactly like ours. And then at the interface between the, uh, the rocky core and the ocean, you have hydrothermalism. And We've seen it abundantly during this course and even in this uh, lecture that uh, black smokers uh, and hydrothermal vents, cold sieves, are very interesting for uh, astrobiological study. So we thought that we do have similar condition on our planet and that's, for instance, uh, in the Arctic where you have a semi-permanent ice cover and uh, this ice uh, sits on top of an ocean and at the bottom of this ocean you have cold seeps, you have hydrothermal vents and so on and so forth. So we thought that might be an analog with all the limitations that clearly you can understand. And we uh, were lucky enough to jump on the uh, Kronprinz Agen vessel, research vessel during the ACMA Ocean Sands cruise. Uh, to do what? To collect the ice. Remember, Enceladus is covered by an ice shell, so it makes sense that future missions will be only able to touch the surface of that ice. So we thought, can we analyze this ice and prove that there is a, a really a hydrothermal activity or seepage of methane at the bottom of this, um, uh, the ocean on this tiny moon? We should try on something, let's say, easier to catch, like the ice in, a dark, in, in, in the Arctic Ocean, and uh, understand what are the, uh, the odds of finding any astrobiological clue. So again, two ideas in parallel, a moon far, far away, and something on our planet that it is extreme, not as extreme as Enceladus, but it has some common threat with with it. My take on message is that um, extreme environments or materials, we didn't talk about materials but there are some materials that can be used, have some characteristics uh, um, in common with uh, other celestial bodies. So they become natural laboratories for us, uh, uh, geologists, biologists, uh, chemists, anybody interested in the, uh, the study of other celestial bodies. Um, it's clearly a multidisciplinary uh, effort, so 
you will find many different disciplines that are playing together and uh, uh, including engineers because in fact you can use these extreme environments to test instrument for future and uh, ongoing missions uh, so extreme environments becomes a fundamental step in order to further our knowledge of life outside our planet or even how other planets might work this I want to thank you and if you're interested uh, in uh, more uh, planetary geology um, we have uh, a module every year that can be attended online on this website here which is the Center of Excellence of Space Science and Technology created uh, uh, through uh, an African project called Fast for Future and you're all more than welcome to uh, write me if you're interested in taking part in this module. With this one, I thank you. Uh, see you soon.